Thank you very much. Um, apologies in advance. This is a very unpolished uh, presentation. I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to come out of my mouth myself. So um, just uh, last minute preparation. So um, obviously we would have really liked to have heard the official side from uh, the MAT standards um, and around uh, the um, purpose of the MAT standards and where we're at in terms of embedding those. So whilst I'm going to talk today about the theme of MAT and why drug treatment is important, um, I'm not going to talk with authority on benchmarking reports or red, amber, green statuses or anything like that. So really the thoughts today are about the importance of ensuring that we have effective and equitable drug treatment for people in the context of drug death prevention. We know that providing people with this treatment is uh, a protective factor against overdose deaths and when delivered effectively um, we could be saving way more lives. So we know in Scotland that we have around 60,000 people experiencing drug problems. And it, one of the questions that's always asked, in fact I did an interview uh, with the Pennington Institute the other week who are actually the founders of International Overdose Awareness Day and one of the key questions that always comes up about Scotland is why is it that in Scotland you have such high rates of drug related deaths in comparison with other areas so you can talk to the complexities and all the issues that we face in Scotland around poverty, deprivation, trauma, um, people with really significant physical health issues but one of the key drivers here is also the lack of people that we have actually engaging in drug treatment. So we have less than 40% of people who are actually getting the treatment that would potentially save their lives. So today I'm going to focus on a few areas um, which I've um, stolen from a previous National Treatment Agency uh, presentation, I believe. And it's around what, your, what a treatment service should look like. So treatment services should be easy to get in, easy to stay in, easy to get out and easy to get back in again. And those are the four things that I'll sort of have some reflections on my backgrounds uh, working in drug treatment services, although that was many a year ago now, but certainly the work that we've done working with local areas around what treatment services look like just now. Whilst many of the people in this room will have made significant changes themselves and are actually the key driving force here, we can't shy away from the fact that there are still major issues. The system is not perfect. The system is not serving people in the way that it should. And if it was, then we wouldn't be here today discussing this. So um, it takes me back to uh, when I was working in a drug service and we had heat targets. And the heat targets were intended to reduce the waiting times for people away from what had been massively significant problematic waits from months and months to sometimes years for people actually being referred into a service to then get onto a prescription, which seems hideous now when you think back to, to that, but unfortunately we still have waits for people, so a lot of what I'm talking about has already been covered by Naomi, who talked about that quick access to treatment that we really need for people. So when we moved away from a situation of people waiting months to years to a three-week period, even then, what we were doing was, on the heat target, you could say that the person was receiving preparatory and motivational work. So although you were giving them appointment, they still weren't getting a prescription really within a three-week period in a lot of cases. So now we have moved significantly towards an approach where we want people to get access to treatment on the day that they present. Same day prescribing means same day. It doesn't mean we saw them that day, but then we gave them a prescription nine days later. Same day means same day. So we really need to be looking to how we adapt our services to achieve that effectively. What exactly are we waiting for? We put people through uh, drug diaries. We ask people to demonstrate that they're motivated before we actually get them onto a prescription. And it's just uh, completely unhelpful in that approach. Um, we question people to such a degree of personal information that increases their shame and embarrassment of approaching services. Do we really need this massive amount of questions when people are first approaching our services for help? Um, we need to get more creative about our access points for treatment. So um, we need to be looking at all types of services that could be providing people treatment, and that includes the third sector, that includes better referral pathways, accessing, people are accessing the same sort of systems, we need to be better joining those up. 
Um, personally, my background is nursing. I would like to see the case that every single person who's a nurse working in a drug treatment service is also a nurse prescriber, so that it affords that flexibility around being able to meet people's needs in a lot more uh, timely manner. Um, we also need to get better at our assertive outreach and meeting people where they're at. And like Alex said, people aren't hard to reach. It's just that our services aren't often fit for purpose to meet their needs. Um, it shouldn't be easier to access an illicit supply of drugs than it is to access a prescriber. We also need to make sure that people have the choice um, and absolutely get the choice in what medications that they receive when they attend services. Normally, we just have the choice between methadone and buprenorphine, but we should also be looking at injectable options. There's only one area in Scotland that provides heroin-assisted treatment, which you've just heard from Sackett. So we need to be looking at multiple options for people and being led by the person and their individual goals. Um, whilst a lot of the medication-assisted treatment work that we're doing is focused on opioid replacement therapy, naturally, because opioids are our most prevalent substance and are certainly more prevalent in our drug-related deaths, the reason that they got the name medication-assisted treatment was so that they could incorporate other substances. Um, so we need to be much more careful about how we're managing benzodiazepines, gabapentinoids, cocaine. Like, what are we actually doing for people when they're presenting to services with these, uh, using these substances? Um, and certainly, we've heard from people when we've been doing the consultation work around the standards that uh, people really struggling with benzodiazepine dependence and not using any other substances, but feeling unable to approach our traditional treatment services because they're not using opiates and they wouldn't be seen, um, and, and actually considering themselves you, that they should use opiates in, in order to get access to a service. So certainly um, we're, we're creating major issues, and I'd be interested to hear from people on the panel as well when we, when we talk about that later. So the next bit is about then, we've managed to navigate that whole system and we've managed to finally get in. Uh, we need it to be easy to stay in once we've got access. So when you're in, you should be in. So we shouldn't have this people in and out of services. That's where the danger lies in, in our current treatment approach, people being in and out of services. So we need to do everything that we can to make sure that we keep that contact with that person and ensure that they are in treatment. Um, people lead very complex lives. People often before they've accessed our treatment service are spending their whole days trying to get their money, to get their drugs, to use those drugs and then dealing with a raft of other complex issues in terms of homelessness, poverty, deprivation and everything else uh, that's attached to a complex life. Um, so why is it then we provide somebody with a prescription and we expect that their whole life has then suddenly transformed and they're all of a sudden able to access our services at the time we tell them to access, uh, that they're not going to use any additional substances and that everything's going to be rosy. We need to get away from that thinking and make sure that we are um, appropriately providing support to people in those stages. We shouldn't be having any unplanned discharges. Um, this, you know, we're, we want to keep people in treatment, so unplanned discharges should be a thing of the past. Um, we need to really question the culture and the ethos in our services. Um, are our services punitive? Our services can't truly be trauma-informed if we also have an angle of stigma that's attached to, to the service that we're providing. Do we look at discharging people and uh, or having uh, sanctions on their prescriptions when they're not attending appointments or maybe using on top? Um, I have seen countless letters that have gone to people saying, if you don't attend your next appointment, we'll reduce you by five mils in your methadone. That is not a safety measure. That is a message and it's a powerfully negative one. Um, and also, we're discharging you from the service because you've not complied with our uh, expectations. Go away and work on your motivation. How on earth can you expect somebody to be motivated when they're no longer receiving the prescription that could potentially help them in their life? Um, and ov obviously, every, every aspect of treatment needs to be wider than just the prescription itself, and certainly supporting people with housing benefits, mental and physical health are, are key components of that. Moving on, it needs to be easy to get out. So this is another area uh, that we hear a lot about. So um, we need to make sure that we're listening to people's goals. So whilst we always are trying to put on the protect protective factor of treatment and make sure that people are engaged in that treatment, if somebody's then saying to you that they then want to come out of treatment, we need to work with them. 
yes, we can discuss with them about um, the potential for relapse, but we have to support them with their own goals and their own um, options. Every option should be on the table. If we don't work with the person, they will just do what they would prefer to do anyway. So we've heard from a number of people who'd ask their service to be reducing down and detoxing from their prescription and uh, the service being unable to support that or unwilling to support that. So they've done it themselves. And then of course it's done in a much more dangerous manner. So there's, there are both sides to that and we need to make sure that all options are on the table for people and that includes detox if that's something that we want to, they want to progress. And then it needs to be easy to get back in. Um, so we need to have uh, two different cases for this. So if persons had a planned de de uh, discharge and they're no longer receiving the support from the service, if they then relapse and they need our services again, it should be absolutely easy to get back in and sh there shouldn't be an ethos of that person feeling like a failure because they've uh, tried to reaccess the service. Um, and there shouldn't be any restrictions in terms of prescribing. And again, when we're talking about a uh, person maybe disengaging a bit, we need to have processes in place to ensure that the person is re-engaged before they get to the point of falling away completely. And on top of all of this, we need to make sure that the service is easy to work in, or maybe easier to work in, because you know, we know this is a challenging area to work in. We need to invest in our staff, ensure that our services are properly uh, resourced, ensure that um, there is a real focus on training the workforce and workforce development is a key part to this and improving recruitment so that we get the right people with the right attitudes and the right values. We need to make, look at our paperwork. Are we giving staff excessive paperwork to work in these services? Pilots, like we keep having these pilots and then losing really experienced staff and don't get me started on pilots because we have a public health emergency. We don't need to be piloting anything. We just need to be getting on and doing it. Is there too much bu bureaucracy? There's burnout amongst our staff. Are they getting the proper support? And we need to remind people not to lose that altruism that brought them to this work in the first place. Remember why you started. This work's really challenging, but it's also really rewarding when you're helping people towards their goals. And if there's one thing that's for certain, that we can't continue with the status quo, because if nothing changes, nothing changes. Thank you.